Good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis N. Holson, Chief Learning Officer of the National Art Education Association. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our webcast for tonight. We're focusing on collaborative tape art, facilitating creative art making experiences, sponsored by Davis Publications. For tonight, we're using a Zoom webinar feature. The chat box will be open, so feel free to add comments or questions along the way. We'll finish with a question and answer session if time allows. With that, please welcome Tony Henneman, Marketing Director for Davis Publications, who will introduce you to our panelists. Take it away, Tony. Thanks, Dennis. Hi, everybody. As you may know, Davis has been dedicated to art education for the last 118 years, and our mission is to provide superior resources to inspire you and your students. And tonight, I'm very excited to introduce you to a few of those resources. For the last two years, I've had the pleasure of working with Leah Smith and Michael Townsend of the Tape Art Crew. They are amazing artists, as you're about to learn, and two of our newest partners. In addition to bringing us a fantastic new resource book, and product for our educational offerings, Leah and Michael continually inspire us with their collaborative method of art making. <clears throat> I'd also like to introduce you to Christy Oliver. Christy recently came on board with Davis as our professional development manager. She has worked extensively with the Tape Art Crew for over a decade in her role as the program director for Massachusetts Art Allstate. We're so excited to share their talent and energy with you guys tonight. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christy. Thanks, Tony. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, what we'd like to do is share with you um, some of the techniques that we employ when fostering collaborative making experiences in hopes that you might find them useful when facilitating similar experiences in your own teaching context. As Tony mentioned, I've had the pleasure of working with Michael and Leah for over, I'm trying to advance, one more, great for over a decade in my role as the program manager for Art Allstate. Since we've been working together on Art Allstate, we're going to use that as an example to show you some of the methods that we've been using. And we'll talk more in depth about our partnerships throughout the presentation, but the important emphasis here is that we are all committed to continual collaboration with each other to provide the richest experiences possible for art teachers and their students. Just for context, Art All State Massachusetts is an annual program that brings together 144 high school juniors from across the state to work with practicing artists for an intense creative art making experience. Traditionally, the two day program provided an opportunity for groups of students to work collaboratively while exploring contemporary themes, engaging with artwork and solving problems together. Each group is facilitated by professional artists who act as mentors to assist the group to transform studio spaces into temporary art installations that communicate a collective idea. Art Allstate embraces the theme limits no limits as we have limited time and materials, but within those constraints, the possibilities are limitless. Now in our 33rd year, Art Allstate has served over 5,000 student participants 300 artist mentors, and 1,000 art teachers. The students that attend Art All State go through a rigorous selection process where they are first nominated by their art teachers. They then submit an application consisting of three pieces of artwork, one of which is a self-portrait in any conceptualization, and they answer some short written prompts. Each student applicant is then interviewed by a panel of three art teachers. We have 10 interview sites, sites across the state and many volunteers to help make Art All State happen. Art All State also has an enthusiastic steering committee made up of teachers and friends of the arts who meet regularly to ensure the quality and content delivered by the program is top notch. We have many community partners, including the Massachusetts Art Education Association, who has been an in integral to the success of the program since its beginning. It truly takes a village, or in this case, a state, to make this program a success. One of the highlights of the traditional Art All State experience is having the tape art crew create a drawing and deliver an artist talk that's more like a storytelling question and answer after the first day of Art All State. We stress the importance of the tape art crew as the professional model for students to exemplify 
how you can make artwork that is temporary, collaborative, and community-oriented while using limited materials and make a living doing so. This directly relates to what the students are experiencing in their studio groups. Typically, when students first arrive, they're confronted with the monumental tape art creation. And they get to experience how the work evolves during their time at Art Allstate. It's important to note here that in the traditional Art Allstate model, the tape art crew does not create work with the students. They work on their own collaborative artwork while the students work with their groups, with their other artist facilitators using non-traditional materials. However, in just a few moments, we'll be discussing our 2019 and 2020 model, which has both Leah and Michael working alongside the artist teachers and students. I'm going to hand off to Leah and Michael now to speak about the history of tape art and how the underpinnings of their collaborative work align with those of Art All State. And howdy, we've got uh, Michael and Leah here. Hello. <laughs> we're, we're on the uh, on the phone because we're in a small town in Texas that lost its power in a winter storm. Yeah, it's snowing in Texas right now. <laughs> so we will get to images of our work and how we've worked with Art Allstate, uh, but we wanted to sort of give you a ramp up to that by looking at this collection of seawords. And this work here reflects very much the backbone of our own artistic practice and it was an absolute joy in 1995 when the tape art crew first met art allstate and we found uh, peers and kindred spirits in the art that shared these same goals so looking at the first slides 1995 i want to give you a little bit of context to what the tape art crew is what you have is a collection of artists, and I'll do this by the numbers. That collection of artists, when we say crew, we're looking at about 10 active uh, tape artists. And I personally have been doing tape art for over 30 years. Yeah, I've been doing it for about seven or eight at this point. <laughs> and that group of artists over those 30 years have created over 500 large scale murals, much like the one you, you see here in 95. And we can go on to 96. And these are what we consider a large drawing. And in that context, we are public artists at heart. We make work outside. All the work is done in a very con concise period of time, either 30 hours straight or several weeks. But the thing every drawing shares in common is that when they are finished, they are up for 24 hours and then removed. And in this way, we find ourselves being great partners uh, for Art Allstate as a role model for exactly what they were doing in their program. Yeah, the other half of our life is, is teaching this collaborative drawing process. So in that we have uh, worked in a range of institutions, including uh, K through 12 schools, colleges, all the way up to nursing homes, sort of a cradle to the grave mentality. Um, and we've also uh, worked in healthcare settings, as well as uh, corporate settings. And in all those settings, we sort of racked up about, oh, I think over 50,000 uh, first time tape users at this point. So we spent a lot of time um, putting this medium in the hands of, of, of people who have never drawn with tape before. So the images that you're seeing right now are a cross section of drawings we've done for Art All States between 1995 and 2018. Each one of these drawings doesn't have a lot of people standing in front of it, but picture, if you will, at the end of the first night of Art Allstate, 150 students flooding out into the darkness after having made art for the entire day and standing in front of these drawings in sort of a fireside chat and having an opportunity to grill artists uh, in, in, in real time. And we answer their questions as older peers and as transparently as possible and sort of give them some insights into the joy of collaborative art making and also the joy of uh, emphasizing, in essence, process of a product. They know that this artwork they're seeing in front of them is going to replicate what will happen to their work. And when their work comes down the next day, so will ours. And ah, Christy, where are we? We're on 2010. 2010. All right. Excellent. <laughs> Yeah, this was this is a drawing of a life-size house uh, with a uh, zombie apocalypse happening outside. Just for anyone who's curious. <laughs> so, 
I personally love all of the cats in the attic here on this on this one. But. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's a good lesson in public art for anyone is if you look on the second floor, there's a, a weapons building factory. Uh, and something you need in the apocalypse. In the apocalypse, you, you'll need weapons. But uh, something to learn about public art is that if you represent a lot of weapons, it's always good to put something that the people who are not psyched about the weapons keep looking up the drawing. Uh, they find an attic full of kittens, which uh, no one can be upset about. Yeah. Something for everybody. <laughs> And how long would it take you to make something like the one we're looking at now? The one we're looking at right now uh, is about three or four days. And a day for us is defined as a minimum of 12 hours, uh, usually 16 hours of straight work. Uh, when we, the first maybe 15 drawings that were done at Art Allstate, we did it as sort of a perverse performance. performance piece. <laughs> well, we would arrive at seven or eight in the morning and stay up for 24 to 30 hours straight. Yeah, and yeah. that's a good thing for students to see because for some of them that may be the first sort of endurance art making example that they will have seen. The idea of like, oh my goodness, you're drawing for a whole day. It was an act of inspiration because they, they, we, would, we would talk to them at night, they'd get on a bus, they would go to a local dorm, stay overnight, wake up excited and tired, come back, and we were still standing there making artwork. And they would then go in for their final day of making artwork. Yeah. So how to build some momentum. <laughs> and for most of these students, they would only make artwork for 40 minutes to an hour at a time in a traditional classroom setting. So asking them to do it for two hours straight, we really needed the energy and um, role model nature of the tape art crew to show them that it, it can be done. And it's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. And another role we play uh, at the end of our all state is as a uh, bridge or liaison to their parents. So, because when a student comes out all starry eyed about the incredible art they've experienced, they're already interested in art, they now have maybe more momentum to think about art as a career. We have talked to hundreds and hundreds of parents over the last 20 years about how that is possible and how it is a good choice and what art role, uh, art could, role could be played in their lives. Maybe we should uh, move on to the 2019 uh, tape art edition of Art All State, where we went from working on the outside of this, these buildings that students were making within and sort of turned uh, into an experience where the students themselves were doing tape art. And so some of the reasons for this, Christy can sort of go into why that switch happened and how it, how it played out. Great. So by this time, you might be wondering why we transitioned um, this longstanding program into the 2019 Tape Art Edition. Um, we had been very fortunate to have host locations that offered great space to create large, large scale installations. Um, late in 2018, we were notified that our host site was unable to accommodate us for 2019, and thus the steering committee was posed with a very significant problem to solve. Um, in considering the goals of the program, we decided that tape art was the perfect solution. One of the comments we get most frequently um, from our students, um, aside from Art All State changed my life and I finally feel like I belong somewhere, um, is that they want to have time to interact with the tape art and the tape art crew. We hear that consistently from students and art teachers alike. So as a step in that direction for our 30th anniversary, we offered a full day professional development for teachers to assist them in facilitating collaborative tape art with their students. Since this session was so successful, we decided to incorporate the art teachers in the 2019 edition in a new role that had them directly involved in the art making. As I mentioned previously, it takes a statewide collaboration to make Art All State possible. Um, since its inception, the Massachusetts Art Education Association has been active and consistent, an active and consistent partner, as well as Davis Publications, who has been an advocate and supporter throughout the years. We were fortunate to add two hosts this year. Um, we had the Worcester Art Museum, who is actually the original host site for Art All State, and the Eric Carl Museum of Picture Book Art. Of course, our longstanding partner, Tape Art, along with PictoTape, were incredibly active in planning and implementing this new model. So now we're yeah, on one of the PictoTape. Do you want to talk about the, the joys of PictoTape? 
I do. So the tape. One of the main questions we get asked every time we make one of these drawings is what tape are you using? And in our journey as tape artists, we have obsessed over tape. tape. <laughs> and uh, in the 90s, we stumbled across a tape that allowed us the ultimate freedoms. It was a tape that uh, was capable of being put on any surface from a dirty brick wall to a freshly painted hospital wall and come off of it without damaging it. And once you're able to do that, you can treat the entire world as a canvas. When they stopped making that tape, it took us two years to find a replacement. And I emphasize that because that gives you a sense of how specific this tape has to be. We've been very fortunate to find a partner in Canada that can make a tape for us. And for Davis. And for Davis. So we finally got it all put together. And this tape is available to the public. And uh, we have it, it's under the, the name Pick the Tape. And this slide right here gives a little bit of an insight into what the tape is doing that makes it perform differently than any other tape out there. One of the huge differences is that it curves really well, which most low adhesive tapes are not designed to do. They're designed to be making straight lines, which if you're looking for something super graphic is a perfect fit, but we are married to curves and the way that curving allows you to tell stories and create human figures on the wall. Um, the tape rips into small pieces really easily. And, and all these things are, are pointed towards making it a good medium for, for rendering images and ultimately for rendering even three-dimensional things. The, the tape, when curved, can hold its curve. And that's an important thing to emphasize. You can make shapes and pick them up and move them. And that completely changes the way that groups work together. Uh, the pick the tape that is being sold to Davis uh, comes on a two inch core, which makes it much friendlier for a wider range of hands and uh, physical abilities. And it only comes in blue and green. So that's something you'll notice when you see the images that are coming up. Someone, someone out there is gonna think, wait, why don't they have another color? Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that we're actively working on to make happen. Uh, and just as a note, we have used blue and green for our entire professional careers. It was only yeah. blue for a while, it was only green for a while, and then it was blue and green. And we found, especially with working with students uh, and large groups of people, trying to create uh, images that are come off as a single comprehensive drawing, uh, having a limited color palette allows for the collaboration to flow more easily because once you add other colors, it both slows down the choosing process. So it, it slows down the drawers themselves. And it also creates sort of pockets where simply because of color choice, people, uh, people's own work can sort of be separated from that of the group. Where right now the blue and the green people are choosing whether it's sort of a light versus a dark idea about drawing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you add even, you know, a third or fourth color, it starts to become a color choice rather than a, a shade choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at its core, though, this tape gives us the ability to approach any institution and get permission to work inside of them. So as Christy mentioned, we were able to go uh, back to the Bush Art Museum, but approach the Eric Carl and mm -hmm. uh, for our tape for our or I'll say 2020, we'll be able to reach out to even more museums mm -hmm. and uh, meet the students in their own backyards. Yeah, it, especially since the, the shift over from the change in host happened relatively quickly, the tape allowed us to take the same sort of idea about non-traditional materials and materials that students have not been able to work with before. So they're still getting that sense of being thrown out of their comfort zone but it's a, a much smaller footprint as far as getting the materials into the museums or around the state um, in a way that made it a much more flexible option uh, for this year's activities. And super cost effective. You know, the bang for the buck in regards to how much material they use versus its impact, it's hard to find another medium that, that uh, has that good equation. So I'll we'll hand it back to you, Christy, here. Great. Hey, this is this is Dennis. Uh, our attendees, don't forget you can use the chat box and if you have questions, go ahead and uh, type those in and we'll try to address your questions. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, thanks. We would be happy to answer questions. Um, so um, I want to make sure that um, to emphasize that we had two sites for this past year. We were both at the Eric Carl Museum for Picture Book Art and the Worcester Art Museum. 
Um, what you're seeing here is the inspiration that we used um, from the Eric Carl. Um, instead of 144 students coming for the entire time, we divided that into three sessions. So we had three one day sessions that each had about 50 students approximately in each one. Um, we were really excited to be working with the Eric Carl. Um, they had some really, really fantastic exhibitions on view. Um, the three exhibits they had were Illustrated Owls, a Who's Who from the Museum's Vault, Eric Carl Makes a Book, and Out of the Box, the graphic novel Comes of Age. Another change um, to, this, to this year was that we had teachers who were also artists in their own right act as co-facilitators alongside Leah and Michael. Um, each artist teacher attended a training session with us prior to the events. The artist teachers who attended the session at the Eric Carl Museum went and visited ahead of time to choose which pieces their groups would use as inspirations for the collaborative work. So some groups used the um, Eric Carl Makes a Book, other groups used the Illustrated Owls, and other groups used the Out of the Box exhibit. When we visited um, the Worcester Art Museum, Leah, Michael, and I were so taken with the wall at Wham. Um, it featured this piece, These Days at Myuma, um, due to the direct correlation with our art inspired by art model. So here you'll see this work actually reflects the mosaic featured below. You can see it actually in um, the work, but also thematically it's pulled um, some big ideas from there and worked with it in a different way. Um, so through the discussion that we had, we asked the groups to explore this work. So all of the groups that worked um, at the Worcester Art Museum used this piece um, and, or this piece in conjunction with the mosaic as inspiration for their work. So through discussion, the groups explored the universal themes and big ideas presented in the inspiration piece and corresponding mosaic as a creative spark for their own large scale collaborative work. So during the training session with the artist teachers, we emphasized techniques on how to facilitate discussions and engage students with the inspiration artwork without just telling them facts about it so that collectively they could experience their own unique views while identifying commonalities and ultimately inspiration for the thematic narratives at the core of their own collaborative work. Um, Maybe we'll just take a quick second to, yeah. uh, to explain what happens after right. the um, they have this discussion. So the students and their groups and facilitating teachers uh, talked about the works, trying to pull out sort of the universal themes. We had them then retreat to the spaces in which they would actually be drawing so that they could look at the, the spaces that they would be trying to transform through the tape art uh, as they were discussing how they wanted to express those themes in their own way. And we the groups uh, two blocks during the day. So there was about two hours in each block separated by lunch to both talk to each other and make uh, before we sort of regrouped and had the students share with their parents and the rest of the students what was made. Uh, so you'll see in the video club that's coming up, the students in one group explain to you their piece of artwork that they made, as well as sort of drawing the connections uh, and making those connections clear between their work and the inspiration piece. And the reason they're doing it through a video is that there's seven different groups doing seven different interpretations and all of them are radically different from each other yes. in approach and also just how the group emotionally felt about the piece and sort of what consensus they came up with on how to show it uh, visually. So we're going to just be quiet and play a video of them discussing uh, how they translated the piece that Christy just discussed. Um, and, um, we were chosen thinking that, oh, the theme is greed and wealth, and then, like, both of those can impact our planet. And we decided to do, like, a storyline and a timeline of greed, starting from, like, tribal times to now. So we started off in this hallway part with a sort of cave. <coughs> we made some cave drawings on the side with a fire underneath. This is a caveman. He has a thought bubble. And on the big mural, there was a string of pearls that was across the entire table. So we kind of took that concept and throughout the entire piece, 
there is a string of curl tying it back to where we got our inspiration. So out here, you're progressing. You have the rise of kind of agriculture. So this is someone who is taking way more than they need. So we represent that with someone that has four arms. And there's a lot of dead animals to symbolize the waste. As you move on, there's a tree track in its roots and the branches are made of plastic. This was our transition in the middle of the ideas, um, where, so Bill represented this piece with um, the Industrial Revolution and how it was the merging point between sustainably using resources and realizing that mankind would have power over everything and any control type of our planet. We got to the end of kind of our timeline where we realized like humans have been like messing up the earth so much and kind of destroying everything around us and taking what we want, but eventually we're gonna destroy it so much that we end up destroying ourselves. So our environment is gonna basically come back to us and then get what we put out into the world. Great. All right, that's the clip. Uh, so great to sort of see students discussing artwork. If we skip to the next slide, uh, want to talk, sort of start to talk about like, yes, we see that these, they've created these sort of awesome art from art interpretations, but how did we get from looking at a piece of artwork to using a non-traditional material and then uh, creating these types of installations? Um, I know that Art All States, one of their big uh, important uh, aspects is the idea of limits. So creating limits through materials and time and um, group work, but making that through those limits, you can have limitless possibilities for the, uh, the artwork that is produced. So uh, for the limits for this workshop, we had some that were uh, tenants of our own tape art teaching process, which include, for instance, no words or letters. We love the in our own artwork to make sure that there's always a way for the viewer to have an in to whatever we're making and that language not be a barrier for the viewing public. Um, so we just advocated for that to happen also with these students here, this, this making workshop. We obviously had the limit of blue and green tape, the limit of the theme being inspired by uh, the work that they viewed at the museum and using that theme to create a narrative. And then one of the, Next thing, especially because of the high school nature of these students, we thought that using a minimum of three life size figures would help them to focus back on the fact that we are creating narratives and that giving them that as a limit would sort of keep their focus on how to make sure that their, their artworks were representing stories as well as the ones that they were inspired by. And one of the most important limitations. And Leah mentioned it briefly here, is the idea that they have to work together. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> so the slide labeled collaboration versus teamwork is a nice image of students working in some form of unity, unity to make a, a single image. Working with an artist facilitator. Yeah. Now, for the majority of these students, this is the first time they have made artwork with another person. Everyone that's in the room in this picture is a certified expert in their own field. <laughs> They're very good at uh, making imagery and making artistic decisions, but haven't harnessed the power of sort of social art making. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking at how art is made together and some of its benefits. And in order to do that, we're going to use the vocabulary collaboration and teamwork and we're gonna look at a subset of images made by a control group. And that control group is gonna be the fine folks at GE, General yeah. Electric. <laughs> so for eight years, we had an opportunity to work with GE and for a couple times a month, they handed us roomfuls of executives. And under the auspices of leadership training, we worked with rooms full of adults who are very good at their jobs and ask them to break into teams and do collaborative tape art drawings. And through those drawings, we were able to diagnose how well they work together and 
what's important is that in order to have an honest look at uh, their ability to collaborate, there's going to be examples of failure along the way. So the slides we're about to show you are from GE. They're going to include work that is subpar and work that is excellent. The thesis we want to put in front of you is that what we observed in our eight years with GE is that the more leadership training a GE executive had, the stronger their drawing was. And that flies in the face of a lot of your assumptions about art making because those executives tend to be in their 50s and 60s. So they're people who've had extra decades of being able to be have bad attitudes about art, uh, outdrawing their 20s and 30s counterparts, which you would sort of assume would be, have more of the sort of energy and vibrancy of youth behind them. And when you talk to them, sometimes you find out that their uh, love of art ended in middle school and high school. Around the time, that, around the age that we're meeting these art all state students, uh, some of these adults just gave up. And we believe that collaborative art making uh, creates an inroad for them to have better experiences in art and have a sense that the art serves a, a larger purpose. So to that end, the next slide we're going to show you is a slide that is of subpar work. And the slide after it is of the same assignment and it's better. So let's go to the first slide here. This is a slide uh, of 10 people in a boat drawn in about an hour and a half. Now, this was done by uh, GE executives who are at the beginning of their careers. Uh, they're in the 20s and 30s. And what we would observe in this drawing is that everyone drew their own person, stayed in their own silo. And you can clearly see sort of the clouds are raining on just that one person. And the drawing overall has no sense of uh, uh, weight. It has no sense of urgency. It seems like they checked their boxes and finished it. And this is what we would refer to as a failure of a teamwork model. Everyone knew what their assignment was. They got their roll, done, they check their box, and they quit. So let's go to the next slide, which is uh, 34. We see the exact same assignments done by, by more senior executives. And it's 10 people in a boat. And you can tell right away that this is a very different outcome. And what we observed in our eight years is example after example of this phenomenon. And so what we spent a lot of our time researching was how is this happening? Mm -hmm. And what you can observe here is that there are uh, examples of patterns that run through the whole mural, which means that people were making the decision to be in multiple places and they were coming to consensus about uh, what could happen. And it was just a something we've also seen. Outcome. Yeah, something we've seen is that uh, groups who are really using the power of collaboration are more willing to take risks. So in here we see sort of the jump between the drawing and sculpture sculptural aspects uh, that you don't see if we go back to the first drawing. Where so back on slide 33. Yeah, back on slide 33, you can no see that drawing. there were definitely some some more competent renderers. Uh, than others looking at the, the people, but those people who were maybe more confident at drawing never shared their <laughs> their sort of momentum with the rest of the group. So even if somebody was not uh, feeling as confident, they weren't able to sort of gain from the successes of those around them. Right. So back to 34, we'll take one, one last look at uh, the good version of that assignment. And then uh, we'll show you another pair of uh, an assignment with a younger group versus an older group. So 35, we see the drawing, what the assignment was? Space. Space, simple, space, future, in the hands of senior executives. The next slide. We see something, the same assignment, uh, which, um, with a much better outcome. What we want to talk about here is that this is about art behaviors. This isn't about necessarily art skill. This isn't about textbook knowledge. This is about a certain, uh, about uh, the approach to the work and the approach to working with other people. And something we can see is that it's not always about uh, effort. It, the amount of tape in this drawing versus the last one we saw 
on the wall, the amount of actual drawing that happened is not significantly different, but the approaches you can see even something as simple as having that one dark blue line cut behind all of the other figures uh, can really change how a, a piece that's made by many people can start to look like a piece made by a single unit. So if we go to slide 37, uh, this is one of our favorite examples. Uh, both Leah and I watched and worked with this group. This is uh, Executive Band GE. That's the top 3,000 people in the organization. They did this in under an hour. And it shows the history of communication on the far left-hand side. You see the uh, invention of cave paintings, hieroglyphics, written word, and then all the way up through digital communication and emails that start to drive everybody crazy. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they started to depict people being unhappy on their computers. And then the zeros and ones showed up. And in this like, fury and love of their own momentum, they started covering up their own work. And there's a lot of really good visual mm -hmm. decisions being made here by quote unquote non-artists. And that's rooted in the ability to benefit from collaboration. If they're working in a traditional teamwork model, they would have uh, seek to have an outcome before they started. And that might have been an outcome that none of them could have foresought uh, before the making started. So a lot of these solutions were developed in the middle of the process uh, as far as what the visuals would ultimately be. And they didn't necessarily reflect the initial talk about, from the brainstorm. So a lot of these solutions were discovered as the making was happening. All right, so throughout the collaboration has a tendency to be a lot more aspirational in nature. You agree on a collective direction you want to go in, and you are open and responsive to the path as it uh, unfolds before you. Something you also notice as Michael was sort of talking about the ones and zeros going over the work, that was people who were drawing over other people's drawings, which is something that, especially in the art all state that we got to see uh, the high school students drawing is tape art, is it's always great to see them working over each other's work. So often they're like, this is your assignment, that's my assignment. It's really hard and uncomfortable to be like, all right, now I'm going to touch your work and you're going to touch my work. So those feelings are always really good ones to practice. And the tape art sort of allows for the flexibility to like make a line. And if that line isn't correct, there's the safety of knowing that it can be removed really easily. So if your addition or subtraction of work made by somebody else isn't the way that people in the group want to go. There's, there is never sort of like a hard change that can't be undone. Yeah, so in slide 38, we see some like, you know, fairly competent uh, first time tape artists here, but this is a group that's halfway between the beginning of leadership training and working the way up. And what we observe here is at first blush, it looks like, oh, they got some good drawers. <laughs> But if you look at it closely, you can see that every person in this drawing was drawn in their own panel. And then if you look at it even closer, in each panel, each panel has its own ground plane. <laughs> and when you start to sort of break it down, you see that there is a... Uh, a lack of wanting to draw with each other. Exactly. They're just drawing near each other, but not with each other. And... Something we would advocate if you were going to run a workshop with a group of students is to sort of, if you see that pattern start to unfold, to like go up and actually physically have students change positions on the wall uh, so that they can't actually create this sense of siloed work. Yeah, if we, uh, if we were running this group, instead of them running their own group, we would have had them switch places halfway through the drawing. So we're going to show you some examples of where drawings have gone south stray <laughs> because they were just in this teamwork mode, uh, which they're super good at. But it doesn't translate well if you're yeah. trying to have new innovations or come with Teamwork them. is a good, important part of collaboration. It can yeah. create execution. So teamwork is something that you can always fall into once collaboration is happening. But without the collaboration, sometimes teamwork can sort of leave you with a really strict idea about what's happening and not a lot of flexibility. Yeah, so in slide 39, uh, we would refer to this as the week's drawing. I remember this brainstorm. They all got really, really excited about what the thing was going to look like and then just made this and you can clearly see pairs and trios of artists just working Breaking on off. their own and the next slide is slide 40. Slide, well, slide 40 is here to show a phenomena that you will see often when students are asked to work together for the first time you may have a pair or a trio sometimes just a pack of boys who get really excited about an idea and nobody can stop them so i think a lot of energy a lot of energy <laughs> 
So in this drawing here, I think it's uh, safe to say that the sun that is in this work is spectacular. Uh, one of my favorite suns of all time. However, it does not fit the weight of this drawing. So uh, that's an example of uh, them being good teammates in the sense that they made a sun, but bad collaborators in the sense of how it works in the overall piece. Let's move on to 41. This is a, an image where there was a, oftentimes there's a question about like, should we allow them to do a sketch? And sketches are, can be great. They can get people on the same page about creating a singular image. But this group, when it was making the work, actually was super miserable. So they came up with an idea and they drew the sketch and then they executed the sketch exactly. And they wouldn't budge from the sketch. Anybody who tried to add anything new got shot down by the rest of the group. I remember them just grumbling the whole time. At our Allstate, I, you rarely have ever see any fleshed out sketches at all. All the teachers are really good at uh, getting the students to work first. Yeah, I think we'll skip ahead here to 44 and go back to sort of talking about yeah. our Allstate um, and sort of some of the uh, variations that we found when we saw students collaborating. So all the slides from now on are from our Allstate and they're from the Art Allstate Tape Art Edition in 2019. And what we're going to do here is, is show you a collection of slides that uh, will pinpoint some of the advantages of working uh, with this medium in this model uh, and you know reemphasize some of the things that we've, we've talked about before but using the student work. Let's move to slide 45. So one of the things that we got to see was a great range of solutions uh, especially when we were at the Worcester Art Museum all of the groups had the same uh, theme uh, the same inspiration piece and all of the groups still came up with very radically different solutions. So if we go to slide 46, we'll see that this group was very excited about creating a three-dimensional globe that hung in the middle of the hallway. And what that highlights is that uh, within this medium, and this is something we've observed over the last 25 plus years of working in schools, it's able to meet a wide range of learners where they're at. So people who are more sculptural in nature, as you can see in this slide here, find, find their freedom. If we go to slide 47, you can see more of a painterly approach. Yeah. So these students were very interested in using the glass as a way to create transparencies and with a different layers of tape. Uh, and that's something that they, they were really moved by more than sort of the specific rendering themselves. And in the brainstorm for this drawing, they were really interested in uh, this, this green and blue box as metaphor, but had two different solutions for how it fit into the narrative. And here we see a great example of them doing it as a three-dimensional solution as well as a more illustrative uh, version on the wall there. Yeah, maybe we'll, we'll skip through some slides just so that we can make sure that there's time for questions at the end and talk really quickly about the role of sort of the artist teachers uh, which I think Christy can sort of mention because uh, it was different with the tape art versus the traditional sort of art uh, all state model. How are you, Christy? Oh, good. So I'm looking at now the detail slide um, of the, the like octopus rings and the, I think it was like a crocodile backbone using the core. Did you want to say anything about? Um, details or 3D elements or using um, some of the other work had like um, the trash or the plastic plastic bags. Is that is that allowed in tape art? <laughs> yeah, we are. Uh, every project that we've done with tape art has been sort of around different uh, limits and ideas about what students can create. Uh, the good news about the tape is that it because it's both an adhesive medium and a drawing medium at the same time and a sculptural medium, uh, incorporating other mediums like recycled objects, cardboards, structural supports for three-dimensional sculpture is all really easy yeah. and something we, we encourage in, in different circumstances depending on what we want to emphasize. Yeah, our general declaration of freedom is if it's not nailed down, feel free to put it into your drawing. <laughs> with a heavy quotes on the word drawing. We, we use the word drawing to refer to tape art installations um, that include both drawing and sculptural elements. 
And Chris, if you feel like we have time, we can uh, talk about narrative and the role that narrative plays in these works. Yeah, I think that would be a good a good thing to talk about now. We can. Okay. We're looking at. Um, we are looking at slide 53. So we are seeing both Michael and Leah here in the orange shirts working alongside a group. And one of the things um, I also wanted to mention is, so this that you're seeing is the Eric Kral Museum with these beautiful windows. And they are sort of, um, they look like panes or even um, when we were looking at the graphic novel exhibit, there was a lot of conversation about like if they were going to become like a cell each. But one of the things I, I, we can see in this, in this image is that the drawing goes almost like those divisions aren't there and people were working around all of them. Um, in one of the previous examples, you saw a life cycle going through the one with the green and blue striped box. But what I want to emphasize too is even though those divisions were planned as um, from one stage of life to the next to depict that, there was, it wasn't one student per window. So I just want to make sure that as we're talking about collaboration and teamwork that even though those physical divisions, even though they're there and you can see them really well, you kind of have to make sure that you shake them up to make that cohesion, that cohesion across the whole piece. I think that that's sort of an interesting balance to sort of strike. We always try to approach these types of collaborative works not as a teacher specifically, uh, we always like to let students know ahead of time that we are, even me and Michael, the professionals who have been working in tape for many years, looking for them to explore the medium and invent it for themselves. We show very few images ahead of time of our own work, and we're, we always let them know that we're excited to see what they can teach us. And we hope that so that was sort of one of the focuses when we were doing the, the pre-talk to all of the artists uh, teacher facilitators for this workshop was to sort of say, okay, there'll be, a, there'll be moments where you want to jump in and sort of determine what uh, these students are making, or there'll be an idea that you have, but we actually need you to step back and uh, let the students drive what is being made. And one of the things that Lee and I enjoy thoroughly is, you know, and especially for myself, as a, uh, having done this for a long time, is I still continue to learn from everyone we work with. And the highest compliment we can play any group is that after having watched over 50,000 students draw, you just did something I have never seen someone do. And we firmly believe that that happens when they work in a collaborative model. And uh, at our Allstate, we were able to keep that streak going mm -hmm. and we saw a lot of really cool new things. Solution. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can skip ahead to slide 56, Christy. Um, so talking about the role of the artist teachers, um, they have, you know, the role of sort of talking the students through the inspiration piece, sort of getting that conversation going, not sort of not talking about what it, the, uh, the meaning was from their own perspective, but sort of pulling the meaning out of the students uh, from what the students saw. And that's hard for some teachers, like genuinely, genuinely difficult uh, to sort of sit back and listen and what we have found with this medium is that is, since it is new to essentially everybody, it creates a much larger pool of empathy because they're all in the same boat together. And when the teacher is able to participate in that empathy uh, that they have with each other, we found that uh, it's, it's much easier for them to yeah. sort of fall into the role of an artist teacher. Yeah, we let everybody know that it was like perfectly okay to not have the answers mm -hmm. for how to make something out of tape and to like be very upfront with their students or the students that were in each group uh, about the fact that they were also exploring this as a new medium. And Christy, what, do you have any observations about yeah. 2019 versus any of the other art all state years? Or? Yes, I think for for us, the the difference really was that in the past years, we've had professional artists come in to work with the teachers and we 
we give them a surprise material. So we use a lot of non-traditional materials in Art All State, but the reason that we always gave them a surprise was so that they would be put in the same position as the students where they wouldn't be the experts on how to use whatever random material we gave them. Um, the tape in this case, in our 2019 version, um, really was that equalizer for everyone. None of our, our, our artist teachers had experience with tape before this session. So besides our video chat um, explanation and Michael and Leah's lovely videos and demonstrations on how to do it, many of them had not even physically held the tape until the morning of. Um, so I think it's really important just also to emphasize that it's okay to work through those things and to work through them together. Um, it really, really helped our students see their teachers as artists. And I, I cannot emphasize that enough. They were saying things, um, they were commenting about how they felt so privileged to be working alongside, you know, quote unquote professionals and how it really made them feel like they were artists, but that they could also like figure out their path in the art world. Um, but it was also really great to see the teachers asking the students for help when they were stuck on something as well. And it really, um, it really took that traditional power structure that happens in a traditional classroom setting and it just blew it completely up. So it was a really nice way to kind of foster all of that. Um, so everyone really was looked at as co-creators in this space. It was, um, you know, very much Michael and Leah working with all of the groups all day long. Um, and then the artist teachers would just stay with their one group, but really it was a like big giant collaboration to make these happen. Yeah, it was, it was great. And we were, you know, we're always moved by the idea of teachers working with students. And to that end, if you switch to the next slide, uh, we've been sort of working with Davis uh, past the creation of our book uh, on something new that will be coming out sometime next year. We're really excited about the idea of providing you all and all, all sorts of art teachers and community teachers with a path to sort of better understanding how using this medium can create collaborative experiences for students and community members. And so what you see on the slide is uh, three tiers basically that reflect uh, our adventure through tape art. And in, in level one there, that is about working with the cl traditional classroom and how to integrate uh, tape art into just education. We work with not only the art classrooms, but also all of the subjects within a school and you know what, what an incredible social setting uh, that communities will go to. And we like to give that opportunity to focus on just those classrooms. Now in level two, this is the idea that you take students and you bring them out into the public. And as soon as you do that, you're playing by a whole new set of rules, the whole new set of questions Visually, to be answered. Visually, permissions-wise, talking about audience and viewer and what it means to make work in a community and who you should be making work for. And what are the standards for that? What is public art? Uh, and this gets into the idea of the art starting to serve a larger group of people. And by level three, art is citizen. We are looking at sort of cross-institutional collaborations where we're saying, no, we're not just making work in the public, we're going specifically to directly to groups of uh, people in institutions, often like hospitals, rehabilitation centers, senior homes, psychiatric wards, and bringing the power of art to them. Yeah, using art as a purposeful medium for service uh, in a way that uh, we've seen really moves both community members and students. And so as the, you know, the hundreds of schools we've worked in over the years, we've done variations of all of these things. And over the course of the next year with Davis, uh, we're going to standardize it and make it something that any teacher, if they wanted to, would be able to have the resources in order to learn those skills. Uh, we'll just move on to the next slide. Uh, this is something that we have already created that is already available. We did it. We did it. Uh, this is um, our, our book that talks about the, a lot of the things we sort of discussed today and a lot of other answers. So that goes through 
uh, all of the things you might need to know to start running these types of workshops from the beginning, like brainstorming and how do we make our pieces and works come together to technical questions about how to use the tape itself and how do I draw certain things to sort of ending with philosophical questions like why should it be temporary and is tape art graffiti? Uh, and also how to evaluate the artwork. Yeah, assessment so tool. Assessment <laughs> tool. So you have a group of students, they just, they just worked on a wall. How do you deal with Stephanie? <laughs> <laughs> right. How do you grade an individual student within a collaboration? We've spent a lot of time and study and actual research uh, in trying to figure out what those assessments could and should be. And uh, yeah, that's, that's something that you can, if you're interested, uh, get the book and read more on. All right. I think we're yeah, towards we're, the end of our... Yeah, we only have a few minutes left and I would like us to address most of the questions. I think they're pretty yeah. easy questions, if you don't mind. You got it. Go Shoot. ahead, rattle through. Um, there's a lot of questions about the environment. Uh, is the tape environmental friendly? What do you do with it when it when you're over, when, when it's over, uh, throw it away, or what do you do with it all? Absolutely. So there's a, a wide, wide range of answers to that. At its core, the answer is that it is technically biodegradable. It is uh, paper with a glue backing. Now, depending on what state you're in, the rules change. So we've done uh, tape art coast to coast. And uh, in the 90s, to be quite honest with you, it wasn't recyclable. But by the 2000s, almost every state was able to recycle it in some way. In our state of Rhode Island, where we are from, it can be in a ball the size of your fist. a fist. And uh, depending on who you talk to the recycling plant, even a volleyball. So how do you dispose of it? Uh, it's something you would just check in with your local recycling plant it about. It depends on the machines that you have available, what size ball can be pl placed in those machines. Yeah, the general rule is if it can be ripped by hand, it can be recycled. Uh, but we found that a lot of schools, once the work comes down, use the, the balls of tape as raw material to do other artworks. So it can continue in, in, to be a perpetual art making yeah. material. Everyone yeah. figure out a way to recycle it if they're able. And yep. that was the question, I had a couple of questions here if you've worked with middle school students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we worked all the way down through kindergarten, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> it gets a little bit hard once you get with the, the really young ones as far as just ability to rip tape, but there are exercises um, that can, can serve younger students as well. And we've seen a lot of great elementary school drawings. Middle school is is awesome. They're rock awesome. stars. <laughs> and something we like to do with middle school students, uh, sort of in the artist citizen vein, is we like bringing middle school, middle school students to go work with adults with um, disabilities. With disabilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a field trip that's really important because middle school students are really at the beginning of starting to make sort of um, decisions about how they're going to treat other people. And by getting them to collaborate with people who are need older, older but... uh, have disabilities, need a lot of empathy, uh, they can sort of help, you know, form who they will become. Yeah. So we had a question here about if there are videos available uh, so they can see more. Yeah. There are. Uh, we have, a, I believe, if we go to the last slide, there's a link to a landing page that will have some resources. Um, these include some teaching resources, uh, video from a TED talk that we gave about the sort of more deep dive about collaboration versus teamwork. Um, there's a, a lesson plan on yeah. there. We also, if you go to tapeart.com, you can see more of our professional work and there's some videos on um, the press kit page of our website that will show you sort of what tape art looks like in schools and some of the our biggest uh, projects. Yeah, definitely hit that that Davis Art Art com link here because uh, there's also a raffle going on. You can pick up a copy of the book and a go kit. The go kit is that picto tape that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, it's being it's being sold exclusively through Davis. Uh, I don't know, they're the only one selling it. It's a darn good price. Yeah, it'll get you started. That landing page will get you to a bunch of other resources on the actual collaborative tape art page of the Davis Art website as well. We have some great teacher questions. For example, how much guidance do you give uh, for the ideas that come to fore or the themes? Another good teacher question about 
how do you start collaboration? Absolutely. So addressing the first question there, the, uh, the, the length of the brainstorm before drawing happens, let's say it, it, you're doing an hour and 15 long workshop, it's probably max 15 minutes of brainstorming. Yeah, and when we, we do, uh, we always give sort of a very brief demo when we start, and that demo includes just really the basics like curving and ripping tape, and we make it clear uh, that we're looking for the students to experiment. So a lot of times we're sort of a little bit less on the front end as far as explaining how the medium can be used uh, because we're looking for students to really uh, show us what they can do. But in regards to the brainstorm, we do sit in on brainstorms and we listen to them talk. And being the more experienced person in the room, we will look for maybe connections between ideas that they have. Uh, one of the classics is if you have a pack of people who are like, I want to do sports. Another one's like, I want to do nature. Mm -hmm. Another one's like, I want to do dogs. Looks like you're drawing a park. <laughs> so there to sort of uh, maybe not direct what they're going to make, but mm -hmm. to sort of help them come to a common ground and a framework in which everyone can, or the most people can, can be drawing something that they're excited about. We do often give prompts that are more specific depending on sort of the goals of the workshop. And, and in that case, those prompts sort of help to start what the collaboration is gonna be because you're asking them a question mm -hmm. and uh, the visual will be a response to that question. In regards to getting to, to work collaboratively together, and I, I know for most art teachers, that's a, a, a real mystery. The tape art medium, because of its scale, naturally leans itself into collaboration. As soon as you're standing shoulder to shoulder facing a wall and you invite students to draw life size, really big. <laughs> really big, they're able to talk about what they're going to make much easier because it is a life size scale. Right, so if I tell Michael that I want to draw an elephant on the wall over to the left of us, mm -hmm. he can sort of picture how big that elephant is gonna be and we don't need a sketch to get us started. He can just sort of like envision how, how much space I need and what that will be to get started. And he can go into the other side of the wall and start drawing the tree that we talked about without sort of needing to, it allows for a, a greater sense of trust among the group. And because you are making a piece of artwork that is consuming the space that you're in, you're sort of, in your own active art theater the whole time. And since the medium meets the artists where they are, everyone is able to find a role within the, right. the artwork. If you like making patterns, there's tons of patterns you can do. If you like careful rendering, you can take on the figure. If you like making textures or three-dimensional sculpture, there's something for you as well. So all of these sort of elements of different things that different students will prefer to make can all be incorporated into a single piece, which allows it to be uh, a more easier route for reaching a happy collaboration. And for well, our teachers, saying, that's what I like about your presentation the best, is that you are teachers and you use artistic language along the way, drawing, line, curves, the textures, the collaboration. It's not just a lot of tape on the wall and that's clear. No. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous presentation. Running a little late, uh, I just want to cover a couple of things and maybe turn it back over to you, Tony, if that's okay, or Christy. Uh, for one thing, I was thinking about how much pizza you two have eaten late at night uh, <laughs> on, those, on those murals. And to remind our audience the reason that they're on audio is because they're in a snowstorm in a small, powerless town in Texas. And I appreciate the collaboration that uh, Christy and Tony and the two of you have given to make this successful tonight. So thanks so much. And with that, mm -hmm. let's turn over to Christy and Tony. I just wanna mention real quick um, before letting Tony say goodbye, um, that if you do wanna see Michael and Leah in real life, they will be both at the Florida Art Education Association Conference and the California Art Education Association Conference. So if you happen to be um, near them, please go and say hello. They'll, they'll be there for the entirety of both, um, making beautiful tape art murals. And you can talk to them, you can touch the tape, you can answer, I'm sure they'll answer any questions that you have. Um, and if you're interested in any professional development or school visits, or if there's anything else we can help you with, please head over to the link and we will be happy to help you.
And if you're going to be at NAEA in Minneapolis this year, we have a really great surprise planned um, where you'll get to touch all the tape that you want and play around with a really, really big wall. Um, I did want to just invite everybody to please visit the URL that's on the site on the uh, screen right now. There's a raffle where you can win the collaborative tape art book as well as the Go Kit free lesson and a bunch of teaching resources. And I just wanted to also to say thank you all for spending the evening with us. And one last thing, uh, this has been recorded. And for those of you who were uh, entering late, uh, we'll send out those links as soon as possible, or you'll be able to get those through Davis Publications or NAEA. Thanks once again to Michael and Leah and Christy and Tony for pulling this all together. Fabulous. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Good night.